All right, everyone. Um, everyone would take their seats. Uh, I want to wish you all a warm welcome to the closing panel of our Marxism Day today. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. All right. As I said, uh, welcome to the closing panel of Marxism Day today. Um, we started 15 minutes later, so that also means we're going to continue until uh, quarter past five uh, with this panel, and afterwards there will be uh, some more activities, fortunately. Um, also, contrary to what was said earlier, this panel is going to be fully in English. Um, I'll repeat this in Dutch for the people who don't speak English. Um, okay. Okay. Um, ja, dag iedereen en uh, welkom bij het laatste panel van uh, de Marxisme Dag vandaag. Uh, we beginnen een kwartiertje later uh, dan op de planning staat. We gaan dan ook een kwartiertje langer door, dus uh, tot kwart over vijf. Daarna zijn er nog wat uh, spannende activiteiten beneden, dus uh, blijf vooral nog even hangen. Um, ja, in tegenstelling tot wat er uh, eerder werd gezegd, zal deze slotpanel vandaag helemaal in het Engels zijn. Als je vertaling nodig hebt, kun je de QR-code daar op de deur scannen en dan krijg je toegang tot het live document uh, waarin het zal worden vertaald. Uh, je kunt je bijdrage natuurlijk wel in het Nederlands doen, straks in de discussie. Zo. Is nou oké? Ik kan hier niet. Ik moet gewoon het echt heel dicht zijn. Oké, is dit beter? Ja. Cool. Um, right. Before we get started with the panel, um, I just wanted to quickly thank everyone for attending uh, this Marxism Day today and participating in all of our great discussions. Uh, we sold almost 100 tickets for this event today, and I think from all of us coming together, there have already come so many uh, inspiring discussions and connections. But yeah, it's not over yet. We still have uh, a chance now to discuss with these last panelists on the question of um, how to build a fighting left, uh, a left that can oppose the rise of the far right and build uh, international solidarity. So my name is Aiden. Um, I'm a member of the International Socialists uh, from Groningen. And with me here today, I have uh, Gali, who is active in Students for Palestine. I have Hannah, active in Justice, uh, uh, what was it called, sorry? Justice, Justice Now, Now. <laughs> and, uh, and Fossil Occupy, and uh, Lorraine Smith, a member of the International Socialists who is active in climate and Palestine movements. Um, we would have been joined today also by Ibtisim Abazis from uh, Meltpunt Islamophobie, um, but unfortunately uh, she is ill and she couldn't make it today. So um, today we're going to be starting with uh, Lorraine. Um, all the speakers will have about 10 minutes. Um, then we will have a discussion with the room. And uh, at the end, I will give the speakers a chance to round off and I have some announcements for everyone. Um, all right, handing it over to you, Lorraine. Thanks. Is this close enough? Okay. Um, yes, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming so much. Um, I think um, I can speak for yeah, a lot of people from the organization to say that it's been a really successful day. Uh, we've had so many, many uh, wonderful meetings and I hope you all feel really inspired to use everything that uh, we have learned today to take to the streets again. Um, and yeah, we organized this uh, last session specifically with these different representatives of uh, movements because we think it's incredibly important to talk about um, to, to talk about how we're going to move forward as a left. And I wanted to primarily reflect on the different movements that our organization has been really active in in the last year, uh, primarily Palestine, climate and anti-racist movement. Uh, and also because my own activism is largely centered around these movements in the last uh, months. Um, and I think especially coming out of like the corona period, we can see like a really big upsurge of different, uh, yeah, dif different movements. Last year, we've seen the impressive blockades that were organized by Extinction Rebellion, who managed to really block the uh, A12 road for 27 consecutive days. 
The climate march was the biggest climate protest ever organized in the Netherlands with over 70,000 people. And we have seen incredible amounts of people taking to the streets uh, for Palestine and to end, end uh, the attack on Gaza. Uh, with local groups pop popping up everywhere and organizing their own protests. It's really, uh, really good that uh, these movements are really taking uh, that next step. Um, but we also have to be honest and critical because the gap with the established left is um, larger than ever, or really large. And this became really clear also in the last elections. Um, I think we can see that the strategy of the parliamentary left has not been fruitful at all. Over the years, we have seen them, um, yeah, seen for, uh, for example, the bigger parties moving more and more to the right and not opposing the right wing cabinet at all in the hopes of being seen as a good party to cooperate with and work together with in the future in a cabinet. And this kind of reformism has led to nowhere but a decline of uh, the left and the upsurge of the far right. Um, these uh, established left-wing parties have been moving steadily towards uh, the right in the hopes that more right-wing voters will choose uh, for them instead of voting for the far right. And in the last years, we have seen that racism and Islamophobia are, have become so normalized and the PVV is now even larger um, than all of the left in the Tweede Kamer together. Um, I think what we can expect for next year is that um, this will increase the confidence of the far right to also attack our actions. And I think um, they will be given a carte blanche to do so from the right wing cabinet. So it's now more important than ever to think really strategically about how we can make our actions as big as possible, because uh, we cannot expect um, the state to protect us. Um, and our safety uh, on the streets really relies on our numbers. Uh, yeah, we need to take this um, uh, threat of the far right seriously. And I mentioned before the successful uh, blockades of Extinction Rebellion. But I think uh, one of the shortcomings was exactly this, that uh, the blockades in the end ended for a number of reasons. Um, also because they achieved somewhat of a win, their demand of ending the fossil fuel subsidies was taken seriously by the Tweede Kamer. Uh, but also because the far right had, had been attacking their actions and the actions became smaller every day. Um, and the leadership uh, of these blockades did, um, aside from organizing the solidarity protest, uh, did not do enough, enough to really make the um, blockades broader and connect them with other struggles. And I think we need to translate these lessons uh, um, to the Palestine movements as well. As we've seen a clear dip in energy in the last weeks, we need to really think about how we can put more pressure on the established left. Um, uh, and the climate to also mobilize for Palestine and, for example, the sit-ins. So these actions do, in fact, become bigger and stronger. Um, yeah, I think we need to think about how we can build movements from below that also make the connections, like I say, with different struggles. For example, I think it's very important that one of the biggest movements that we have, the climate movement, uses their mass to also connect with the different struggles and grow as a movement. Uh, for example, by making a connection between anti-racist movements and the struggle for the liberation for Palestine. Uh, because we also saw the need, this need, we together with Students for Palestine and BDS, we organized um, a Palestine block at the Climate March. Uh, because we think it's really important that it was like highlighted like Palestine is a struggle for climate justice as well. But the organizers of the march um, uh, actively discouraged our participation in the demonstration. I think we've all seen um, how the, the, the person on stage, Sara, was silenced, but we also um, were actively discouraged from participating uh, because the organizers of the march were afraid the march would then be all about Palestine instead of the climate. And I think this is problematic, not just because we care so much about Palestine, but also because it's not a strategic decision. It really relates to this question of how we need to build a movement that, that can actually win and it can actually grow. And at this time, there was so much energy for people who took to the streets for Palestine and the larger cl climate movement then did nothing to connect with this. 
Um, whilst if they did, it would only have made us yeah, grow as a movement, it would have made us stronger, um, which is also a problem for the climate movement, which is a largely white uh, movement. Um, and I think um, we also organized um, uh, the sit-in of t two weeks ago, you can really see that this was actually taken seriously and the ef direct effect of that. So this was the day after Geert Wilders was elected and uh, we had already planned the sit-in. We have been working on this infrastructure for a long time and we decided there was a bit of a discussion in the group to also connect this to the PVV um, because the racism and Islamophobia of the PVV is directly uh, linked to Palestine. And we did it, uh, that we did a sit-in before, and then we joined a demonstration against Geert Wilders at the uh, Dam, uh, which was organized by a different group. And altogether, it was so huge. It was really, really powerful. Um, and I think it could only have been done, yeah, by this connection, because the group that organized the demonstration at the Dam, they wouldn't have mobilized more than 200 people um, but now, because of the sit-ins, we were there with 1,500. It was really powerful and it was really uh, good. And I think, yeah, um, organizing against the PVV has to come from uh, uh, making these connections because we cannot as, uh, expect this from the established left who also organize protests. Well, they call it not protest, but more hugging sessions to release some anger. So we really have to yeah, do it ourselves. <coughs> and I think uh, what lies under this is also the discussion of why we organize these moments of protest. And I, I disagree with the idea that we organize actions and demonstrations, um, which is kind of a, uh, this, uh, how to say, hearsay idea? Uh, prevalent idea that we organize these demonstrations and actions to build pressure and that by every action we take we become stronger and we put more pressure on politicians and that at the end they are they have no other uh, alternative than to change their actions um, whilst I see it as a completely different thing we do uh, the things we do we organize uh, we need to see them as building relations and to build networks and to build uh, yeah, power. And as international socialists, we think that the root cause of the problems that we see in the world are related, uh, related to the capitalist economy that puts profit over everything else on earth and needs uh, racism, sexism, and all forms of division and marginalization to divide and rule. And the only way out is to overthrow the system um, and only like a large uh, majority of united workers and all oppressed people can build up the power to do so. And this may sound like really huge and uh, unachievable, but I think we need to see what we do as building towards that power, building towards that mass. Um, yeah, and we need to struggle to, to win for the majority for this cost. And I want to end with saying that I think building uh, up to this takes work. Um, I know we've all had a lovely day and it's been really interesting and uh, we've learned a lot, but I hope we can translate what we've learned to the streets. We have to realize that consciousness is not static, that even though we live in a country that if the, in which like a vast majority have voted for an openly racist uh, uh, parties, <laughs> we can actually organize to turn the tide. And this is a re responsibility that we have as revolutionaries. Um, and we see, have seen how the tide could be turned, can be turned uh, when we look, for example, towards Zwarte Piet. Uh, it was unthinkable that uh, a large majority of the Netherlands would um, ever be in favor of uh, abolishing this. But now two thirds of the Netherlands thinks um, it actually should. And this has uh, been like one of the biggest success in the anti-racist movement, I think, in the Netherlands in the in the last years. Um, yeah, so um, the same can be, I think, um, the case for Palestine or to win workers for climate justice. Um, I think we really need to take up this this responsibility seriously to to educate and win people for our cause. We can do this um, as IS, we do this, for example, with our newspaper and organizing this meeting, but also in the coalitions, we try to do this by with the Palestine bloc 
um, by also, for example, ha um, handing out flyers to people who come, came to the demonstration that um, explained more about the relation between climate justice and Palestine. Um, and of course, you can say a large majority of the climate movement um, is maybe a bit uh, not in favor right now. And we also noticed that, but also a lot of people, when we talked to them, they were really like, yeah, I can see how it's kind of related. And also when I think about this, I think about the first demonstration I ever went to, which was the demonstration against Wilders and Trump. <coughs> and then I saw a Palestine flag and when, yeah, me and my friend, uh, we were like, yeah, but what does that have to do with uh, this right now? We didn't know anything about Palestine at that point. And then someone explained to us, well, it's actually very much interrelated. And we were like, oh, OK, thanks. And then, <laughs> and then uh, y y yeah, y the, the, the consciousness can grow. Um, yeah. Um, so I think as revolutionaries, to sum up, uh, we need to educate ourselves. We need to educate the broader public. And we also have to translate this education, uh, this knowledge that we gain uh, towards building network, also at, to the places we work at. Um, yeah, uh, there was also, for example, a lot of frustration that the union was not in solidarity uh, with Palestine. We've all seen uh, how the Belgian unions, they took it upon themselves to rally for um, a strike for the dock workers, um, I think. And the union in the Netherlands had, did not make any steps towards that. Also, there's a lot of uh, criticism towards the union uh, related to the climate movement that they are not taking up this seriously. But I think the, the union will never move unless we make them to as well. And I think the established left and all these parties that I've talked about, they will never change unless we build up power to make them change. Um, so I hope we can translate everything and uh, really uh, yeah, work towards building these networks from below. Yeah. Amazing, thank you so much, Lorraine. Then now, um, handing it off to Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, yeah. Thank you so much for coming here and listening to all these interesting discussions. So I'm going to speak about what we're trying to get to, like the state of the left right now and how we can move on from the perspective of like, oh yeah, like this from the perspective of the Palestine Solidarity Movement, because we've seen the last two months that there is no real possibility of like building up a left that isn't anti-imperialist and that isn't in solidarity with Palestine, that it is a necessary component, that it's something that brings people to the streets, that brings people to actually show up and try to change the society we're living in. So it's really important to like go back on what has happened in the last two months since October 7th and what lessons we can learn from it. So as you all know, this is how it all started on October 7th with the operation launched by the Palestinian resistance, most specifically by Hamas uh, against the Israeli state. The operation by itself was, to a certain extent, a strategic and a military success. It basically changed the yeah. geopolitical reality of the region. I'm from Morocco. Moroccan politics died in 2011, and now for like the last two months, there's been just like a revival of like mobilization of actions of all kinds related to Palestine or not. So this has been a success despite the aggression that is currently taking place, despite all the violence, the genocide violence that the Israeli state is perpetrating right now. And also we've seen it here where for the first time in a very long time where we've seen people that don't usually show up to protest, that don't usually mobilize themselves, come, show their solidarity and show that they're ready to fight and to support the Palestine Solidarity Movement in the future. I think we've seen the largest mobilizations in the last years. I remember on like the first protest on the 15th, yeah, like we were organizing the stewarding for the protest and we were like, probably we're gonna get like 2,000, 3,000 people, it's gonna be nice. And then we show up on the dam and it slowly grows and grows and grows and grows and like at the end 15,000 people all over the square and just marching throughout Amsterdam. So, that, so that's definitely a very important success. We've seen new categories of people being mobilized, as I said before, and multitude of actions, of initiatives taken. And this is also part of like an international push where everywhere on the world, in the West and outside, people have been protesting, people have been uh, clearly saying that they refuse what's happening right now in Gaza and saying their solidarity with Palestine. I think the conclusion from that is that our main success, though, is uh, we, after all these years of effort, we finally had a victory in the cultural battle. People all over the world 
are in support of Palestine. There are artists that are showing their solidarity, academics, unions in certain countries. So people, in, we've managed to shift the general position all over the world, even in the in Western countries, on Palestine, on the situation in Palestine. So that is definitely a victory. But and that is the main problem. We haven't really seen any political concretization of of what has happened. Uh, what I mean by that is, I mean, you've seen how all Western states, all Western leaders have given, again, their unconditional support for Israel. The U.S. vetoed two days ago a U.N. resolution to call for a ceasefire. And so basically what I mean is that despite all the all the efforts that have been put, despite all the people that have had hope in all these actions, in all these protests, well, we're still facing a wall and we need to think forward how to break that wall, how to continue uh, pushing for it. And I think there's two issues here. First is, and I want to come back to that at the end, but I'm going to still say it here, is that the radical left has kind of abandoned any form of strategy in terms of electoral politics. I don't think we can really have a relation of power or any power struggle with the established neoliberal left or with the right if we can't scare them away and like actually get their votes and actually have people in the halls of powers that are pushing for what we are saying. So I think that's something that we need to think about how we can get more involved because, I mean, we've seen in the last elections, parties like Bay Ain that are generally representative of what we're thinking in this room haven't been able to actually get their voice out. I think, like, like uh, the during the week of the election, I checked the last uh, like article on Bay Ain in like a big Dutch newspaper, and it was in September, so over two months there hasn't been any coverage, which obviously makes sense because those medias are not working with us, are not on our side, but it also means that we need to get more involved and try to like actually think about how we can use electoral politics, how we can use those moments to push for our struggle and like to basically build a political movement on the side of the social movements that we're pushing for with protests, with action and stuff like that. And I think another issue is the limits of like wide spontaneous organizing. It's very good to have large protests, to have a lot of people show up, but these type of actions alone are not enough to actually pressure institutions to to act on it, to actually respond to our demands, to actually negotiate or even clearly reject them. They can just ignore it and continue despite the larger numbers of people. So we need to think about how to use our energies differently and to create new forms of actions that are more effective in that sense. But what, what I'm going to come back to is now that we've won the cultural battle, we have a, a huge force. We have a n number of people that are that are hopeful, that really want to continue this fight, that are ready to get uh, get more and more involved. And it is our responsibility, I'm talking here as an organizer, to not let them go into despair and into disillusion. We need to actually think about how we can give them a direction, give a path for people that are, might not already uh, have a lot of experience to like be like, okay, there is something to do, we can continue, there is, there is still hope, even if it's not always easy. And uh, for that, I think one really, really important thing, that specific, especially for the Palestine movement, is that we need to like start going on to more localized and targeted actions. We need to uh, actually build strongholds, certain <coughs> places where we are winning the battle and that we can use to launch a lar larger national campaigns. I think it's really important now after these two months that we start thinking about how we can target our local uh, u uh, local universities, our workplaces, spaces like that, and actually get wins on those, those local levels where we can actually show people that, hey, there is something that, that can be achieved, there is victories that are possible, and actually build a base to continue forward and uh, grow the movement even more each time. And then I um, want to come back on the points on electoral politics. I think it's really important, especially for the left that hasn't abandoned socialism and for the climate movement to actually start thinking about how to get involved in that, how to like start building a strategy to actually take power because we can continue asking for for our government to do what we're asking them for, but if we can't really take their place at some point and that, like get rid of those incompetent assholes that are governing us right now, if we can't scare their, scare them and like show them, hey, you, can, you might be able to lose your position if you continue this way, well, we're not really going to be able to do, lead to anything. So I think it's really important that we start thinking about how doing that without falling into the entrapments of the established left that has basically abandoned all of, all of our values, all of what we stand for, for bureaucratic purposes and for like little small privileges, like a small office at the parliament. That's not what we want, but we still need to be able to get into those halls of powers and to bring the fight there too. much, Gali. Um, then now I'm handing it over to Hannah. Thank you. 
Um, I'll start off with two things. Is this, can you hear me in the back, by the way? Amazing, cool. <laughs> like this? Yes. Okay, this is really weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I oh, like never really do public speaking, so I'm kind of nervous about this. So I thought I'd mention it, so hopefully it's not as bad. And I have an ear infection, so if you like want to ask a question, please say it like very clearly, otherwise I won't hear you. Um, okay. So I will mostly talk about uh, the fact that I'm organized in Justice Now. And for those who do not know, Justice Now is a group that started about a month and a half ago um, within XR um, that wanted to do direct action for Palestine. And as a lot of you might know, um, XR is not always as intersectional as I hope and I want it to be. Um, so we've experienced quite a lot of struggles as Justice Now and a lot of critique. Um, and I will first start talking about mass mobilization. So the theory of XR is for a big part focused on mass mobilization, believing that we need 3.5% of the population to do nonviolent direct action. And a lot of people within the XR think that we are actually on the right path. Uh, as said before, with the F12, we've seen thousands of people participating in direct action, a historically big number. But what actually is the worth of these people if we're looking at what we actually want to achieve? Climate justice for all, which includes fighting against every form of oppression. XR has always been a movement that is fighting an intersectional fight, but in practice uh, that doesn't always translate. And as we have seen during the climate march where people left because they did not think that the genocide on Palestinian people deserve space, a lot of these newly mobilized people are only here for one thing, to fight the only thing that is directly threatening their own existence, the climate crisis. This closed-minded way of thinking about our world and its struggles endangers those who are actually fighting for system change. The more closed-minded people gain a lot of media attention, which makes sure that the less intersectional activism will be able to grasp this attention not as much. The more closed-minded activists we have, the so-called perfect activists, because it's so much, if there are a lot of if there are a lot of perfect activists, it's so much harder for the more radical ones um, to do their thing without getting so much critique. Um, the easier it is for the government to actually oppress these people. Um, if there are activists with demands that are easy to achieve for the government, those not dem demanding system change, it is easier for the government to ignore the radical ones and remain a public approval when ignoring them. To put it shortly, the more liberal activists we have, the harder it will become to, to create the much needed change. And I myself can understand the appeal of mass mobilization, but in a different way. It is so much easier to mobilize those that are already organized for a different struggle. By not openly discussing, for example, racism and neocolonialism, you are excluding an enormous group of people. In mass mobilization, a lot of people only think about their own kind of people, therefore reproducing the status quo in their way of thinking and as a consequence acting. To come back to my own experience with Justice Now, I've been organizing with NXR for about two and a half years and I've been organizing with Justice Now from the beginning. Um, so from the beginning onwards, we've had a lot of critique. Um, a lot of people within NXR who recently joined think that the climate crisis can be something apolitical and can exist also that the needed change can also happen within a capitalist system. This, of course, isn't true. Uh, I think we all agree. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here, I hope. <laughs> um, there have been several ways we've dealt with this because I do think it's still really important to organize um, even if there are a lot of people who don't agree with you. Um, and we've also debated on possibly leaving XR um, but there are a lot of reasons that we can actually use XR. So a lot of Palestinian groups have had trouble with gaining attention for this cause. And XR has a certain name in the media right now, which makes it very easy for us if we only use the name of XR to actually grasp the attention needed, um, while for others that's so much harder. And a lot of people within XR are, do really care about the planet, but just don't have the understanding yet or just refuse to understand um, that all these struggles are connected. And by actually talking to them and organizing in their movement, we 
force these talks, we force these discussions, and we force that we actually work together with movements fighting for different causes. And I think that's why it's always important to also work together with people who maybe aren't there yet. Um, so it's so much easier to actually create the mass mobilization that is needed. Um, yeah, I think that is it. And